I am the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy. It's an organisation of 3,800 people, 600 scientists that works in 69 countries. And it's the biggest environmental NGO in the world in terms of finances. But I know very little about it. I've actually probably learned more about the Nature Conservancy talking to, to uh, academics and staff here at Cornell than I learned in the last year. So thank you for telling me. <laughs> you know, I should have come here before I took the job, probably. And I would have known more. I'm still sure we'll taking the job, but um, it was certainly very, very useful. And I'm inspired also by how many interesting partnerships the Nature Conservancy has had with Cornell in the past, and certainly that number of partnerships and interactions is continuing to grow. And partly that's what the visit's about, and probably that's where we're going to end the discussion. Uh, at 4.30, there was a pile of undergraduates piled through here. Uh, do we actually want to stop exactly there? Or about there? Um, about there. About there. Yeah, right. So um, we'll have some time for discussion uh, then. You know, how does, I mean, other than, I'll talk a lot about science and policy, and really what I'm going to do is talk about to talk about what our group has done and then transition into what I hope TNC will be doing, but also how do we, how do we interface with universities and other research organisations? What are the best ways to build those partnerships? But TNC always talks about being a science-based organisation. They would claim they're the most science-based of the environmental NGOs in the world. Employ 600 scientists. I don't know where they are, I don't know who they are, I don't even have an email address for them all. Um, but I'm the chief scientist, so somehow I sort of work out who they are and what they want. So it, it's, and it's challenging. Uh, uh, how do you organise uh, something that is in 69 countries with 600 scientists, 4,000 staff, 50 states, uh, in some senses, all sometimes operating moderately independently? So how do you exert influence over that? And if I'd gone, if I'd said of joining TNC, I'd join uh, Cornell, I would have walked into a job where there was a head of a school and there was a dean and there was a vice chancellor and there was undergraduate teaching. And universities are identical across the world. In fact, those of you who have moved from university to university, you go there, not only are universities identically in the way they're structured, uh, the people are the same as well. <laughs> Almost identical. You know, my neighbours in the suburbs of Leafy Brisbane are more different than any of you. <laughs> Almost you know, people up the road, a next door neighbour doesn't believe in climate change, but our other next door neighbour uh, has only one objective in life, and that is to own as many houses as possible and be rich. It would be hard to find those non climate change, I'm going to be filthy rich uh, aspirations in this room. <laughs> so it is interesting, isn't it, how ridiculously homogeneous universities are? There's thousands across the planet. And they're actually very similar. TNC is not the same as the university the structure, but I won't try and explain the structure because that would take the next yeah. hour. But um, uh, uh, what I do want to do is make sure that Nature Conservancy uh, continues to be an organisation that not only uses the best science in the world, but actually also continues to push ahead to help develop the best science in the world to solve real problems. Yeah. And that will be clear from my talk. Uh, and I'll, I'll confess straight up front. Um, I don't really care much about science. I mean, I think it's fun, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm occasionally money to be a scientist. But uh, my objective is definitively to save the planet, and that was my objective from the age of 15. Uh, that's all I want to do. And science is a reasonably pleasant way to attempt to save the planet. That's about it. Uh, and I know that science is useful, it's fun, and it helps to deliver outcomes. And in some senses, the first part of my talk, the first half, is, is how we've used different kinds of science, and sometimes it's actually not even science, it's more economics and engineering and applied math, to try and get policy outcomes, which I know Cornell is very interested in being a uh, land grant university, being focused on delivery of impact. But how do you get it to happen? And is it all a happy story? So Amanda tells a rosy story about our impact on the world and how much our group at the University of Queensland has delivered outcomes in terms of policy. But I'm going to tell you some happy and some sad stories about that. And in some senses, how bizarre, erratic, and irrational the whole world of policy and management is. Uh, before I do that, though, I always have to remember that I um, uh, like all good academics, I try and do as little as possible, uh, and drink as early in the day as possible as well. And somebody's got to do the work, don't they? I mean, somebody has to. Uh, and, and they're called PhD students and postdocs. 
Uh, once a year, I unchain them from their desks uh, and, and I tell them on that day to wear colourful clothing and we take a lab picture and we pretend we're happy. And the rest of the time, uh, they, they are inside writing papers and sticking my names on them. So that's, that's a good system. So, bottom line, you know, I'm just here to take the credit. There's a whole heap of people that do all the work. Uh, I've, uh, uh, built 60 PhD students get their PhDs and, and 50 postdocs develop their careers. And I'm very proud that many of them not only have gone into academic jobs, but they've gone into the uh, government and to the uh, NGO sector as well. So let me thank them all, and there's many of them, and I'll mention a few as we go on. But first, I'm going to give you guys a few, two or three, virtually, I mean, this is, you can tell I don't like science, because there's going to be very good science. I'm just going to tell you some stories uh, about what's happened uh, in terms of science impacting policy in Australia. And the first is quite a short story. It's a story that uh, once it was completed, and this was uh, when I was 42, so it was 12 years ago, sort of made me sufficiently happy that I thought, mm, if I die now, I've done more than I hoped to. And that was a story where we basically brought to an end land clearing across Queensland. So Australia, at one point in the early 2000s, late 1990s, was clearing as much land, uh, Queensland, the state of Queensland was clearing as much land as Brazil. So there's, there's a very big map of Australia, uh, I think it's a four million scale, most of the geographers will know that. There's Queensland, there's Brisbane, a um, very big state. Uh, it goes from 10 degrees latitude, most people don't realise how tropical Australia is. 10 degrees latitude, and I think we're about 26, and it's not 27 degrees, subtropical. Vast areas, uh, basically, remarkably, uh, 70 to 80% of that is uncleared woodland, forest, and there's a shrub land this time. So, it, it, this has been massacred, uh, this is a city, uh, and this is, a lot of this is, is some of the biggest tropical wilderness areas in the world. In fact, if you look across here, that is the biggest tropical wilderness area in the world, because somewhere between Perth and Brisbane, you have several thousand kilometres of coastline, the biggest city being a dozen and Townsville, neither of which reaches 200,000 people, I think. Imagine that. A coastline, the only place you get that is, I think, Siberia and northern Canada. That, that coastline, with so few people, no, no city anywhere near a quarter of people in that entire coastline. So this is a vast wilderness area. But we were chewing up 500,000 hectares a year, over a million acres. That was 10% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions just destroying forests and woodland, uh, and generally, was it making us money enough? Not for that, it was called the soil erosion, that then caused destruction of the Great Barrier Reef, general degradation of habitats, massive loss of biodiversity, biodiversity, uh, uh, destruction of habitat, of course, is the greatest effect of biodiversity, uh, at a national scale and global scale. So, my life has been dedicated in Australia often to try and stop land clearing and we were making sequential victories from state to state, South Australia, Victoria, moving north, and Queensland was the last place. Now I realise in many countries this is not possible. Australia is sort of in some senses the nanny state. We were wearing bicycle helmets 40 years ago. So we are a regulatory, a very regulatory country and we can actually tell people they can't clear their own properties. Don't think that flies in any other places. Mm -hmm. And we got away with that here, and we were fighting these final battles here. How did we do it? Um, well, it sounds like a brilliant science story. So I and, and some of the Green NGOs worked. I wrote a declaration, which was really just a two-page story about the impact of land clearing for 450 senior scientists from across Australia, PhDs, to sign it. We sent it to the Prime Minister and sent it to the Premier of Queensland. Basically, it says land clearing is not a good idea, and this is why. Soil loss, Australia has rubbish soils anyway. Soil loss, uh, most of it could be raised, it need to be cleared. Uh, eutrophication of, of, of riparian systems, uh, impact on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, whole heap of bad things. Basically, from my perspective, loss of biodiversity. We did no new science at all. We took, we just, we, we wrote a statement, put some references on the back to make it look sciencey. Uh, some of the science goes back to 1924. People in 1924 wrote, land clearing causes salinity. People in West Australia didn't get that. You know, a million hectares of land will be completely salinised in West Australia because it's an incredible way of being useful for everything agriculture and that as well. We sent it off, 
And then, lo and behold, two weeks later, the Premier of Queensland, BD said the scientists have said, and apparently, they didn't know this. The papers go back to 19... The, the politicians did not know that there was such a strong scientific consensus about the impact of land clearing on biodiversity and other natural assets. Waved it, said we're going to stop land clearing, and land clearing rates dropped down to 50,000 hectares a year from 500,000 hectares. Arguably, some people say that the only reason that happened was because the minister had a, the premier had a minister who was facing a sex scandal and wanted to create a smoke screen. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, one of the messages of this story is sometimes you win something and you think you win it because you're smart, sometimes you win just because you're lucky and the timing is good. But you don't win anything unless you play and you don't put the stakes in. Um, so that's been a success, but then the other bad side of it, we brought in a new government four or five years ago and they opened up land clearing again. And we've gone back not to 500,000 hectares, but for about 200, 300,000 hectares a year. And we have to fight the fight again. So in some senses, clearly, science can be very, very useful, particularly when you have such a big consensus. And then it's also very distressing to find out, uh, and I think people in this country may have just realised it, that everybody doesn't think like us, do they? You know, evidence doesn't sometimes matter, uh, and a science-based argument, why didn't they know all these things? It's obvious. If you destroy a piece of forest, the, the, the hundred bird species that used to live there are not going to live there anymore. Isn't that obvious? Well, it's not so obvious. It's the second story is a bit more science -y. and what I'm going to talk about now is what Amanda alluded to, and that is uh, conservation planning and its impact on the way we use both the land and the sea. Uh, and in fact, very pertinent to the Nature Conservancy because well before I started working with the Nature Conservancy, uh, they were the biggest users of our uh, systematic conservation planning tool. So I just want to run you through what is systematic conservation planning. Some of you know this already. Some of you will be interested. What I'm going to lead to is again, does it really work? I mean, we're often very cynical, both those people in NGOs and government, because we write lots of plans and how many plans do you have to write to get something to happen? Uh, I've been to places where there's local government offices and they say we need to do some more planning and they open a the door and they show me literally uh, cupboards, wall-to-wall -wall drawers of, of plans that are never enacted. We love making plans, we don't seem to want to enact it. So you can be very cynical uh, of how much planning actually can do things on the ground and I'll tell you some good stories and some bad stories. So what is systematic conservation planning? Um, it's very simple. I would like to build a system of protected areas, both in the land and the sea, and I would like to do it in a way that I get a bit of everything. I want to be representative. You know, I have some species distribution maps, I have some habitat maps, I want to get a bit of all those things. I want it to be reasonably compact and connected, it has to be manageable. But then the thing that actually most people were realising is that um, it has to be in a way that it annoys as few other people as possible. Why? Because you won't get anything if you're going to put marine protected areas in the most profitable fishery areas around Australia or anywhere else. You will not get things that are going to cost you too much. So how do we do that? So what is the problem? And this is where we need to actually formulate that as a problem. The example I'm going to give is the rezoning of the Great Barrier Reef. So where is the Great Barrier Reef? Uh, there's again, uh, somewhere in there, uh, it's about a thousand miles long and two hundred miles wide. There are five and a half thousand reefs. Right, so who really knows what a reef is? It's not design anyway. Five and a half thousand reefs, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Uh, probably most people in the world used to think that that was one big national park. Well, uh, when we started working on this problem in 1998, I can tell you that 4.7% was unfished, 95% was fished. It wasn't a big. Well, it's not a big national park. You know, it's a national park where you measure cows and sheep and logging, but it was a big use, use big massive multi-use area, 95% fish. But of course, this is a place that generates the Australian economy six billion dollars a year of tourism. Six billion dollars a year of tourism, 250 million dollars a year of recreational fishing, and 100 million dollars a year of commercial fishing. So, sort of rightly speaking, we had a, a environment minister called Senator Robert Hill thinking, hmm. How come only 5% is protected? It's degrading, actually, it's still degrading now because of lazy because of coal bleaching. It's degrading. Most of the money comes from tourism, 
uh, one sixty of the money came from commercial fishers. Commercial fishers has access to ninety five percent of it, and fish the need to find. At that, at that point, it was, it was already clear the coral cover had declined from about thirty percent down to about sixteen, seventeen percent. It's now down to about ten percent. It's projected to go to about four percent. If you have been to Australia, get that quickly. Um, Unfortunately. The bottom mix may struggle on for a bit longer. Um, so we needed a better protected area system. I worked with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. The good thing is that one authority managed the entire area. That was, that was lucky. When you're trying to build protected area systems and you've got lots and lots of different land managers and owners, it's very difficult. So this is arguably the easiest situation to get uh, how do you do it? How do you do it? So we need to divide this into bits. So we divide it into 5,500 reefs, and in between the reefs, there's all this other important stuff. We divided that into about 12,000 polygons. This is the kind of data you need. You need data on things like where are fish. Uh, you need data on things like where is the seagrass. Um, so we need lots of biological data in a very well studied reef system. Uh, James Cook University, University of Queensland, Australian Institute of Marine Science, many of the world's most interesting coral reef ecology have come from this area. So we knew a lot of this stuff, we knew where the species were, we knew where the habitats were. I then said, if we're going to do this plan, don't just base it on the biology, you need to know what people do. So it seems obvious now, they didn't want to do that, they wasted two years not doing that. And then I said, you really need to know where people fish. So ask the recreational where they fish. And then we're then going to insert that as a cost surface and we're trying to, going to try and reach the goal of conserving 20% of every one of these other things, 20% of every fish distribution, 20% of the dugongs, 20% of the turtle nesting site, 20% of the sea grass. We're going to try and get all those outcomes in a way that minimises the annoyance of the recreational fishing industry. Why? Because if you start putting marine reserves where Uncle Bob and Auntie Mary fish, and they know the local MP, they'll write a letter, and you won't get a marine protected area system at all. And where do the commercial fleets fish and forage and all those things? Where all that information? So that's the data that goes in. Um, we then put all this grid over the top of it. We know where the costs are, we know where the biological values are, and this is what these problems look like. And this is the simplest version of the problem I can come up with. Uh, just so you can get a taste, but uh, it looks like it should be an easy problem, but it's not so easy. So this is the game to wake you up. It's late up, late in the afternoon. Sunny, I sort of think it should be outside. I want to get every one of those species or habitats, and I want to get them all at least once, and I want to do it for the minimum cost, and I'm going to assume every site there's eight sites there, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Eight sites. Every site's going to cost me a million dollars of pain. Or, in fact, in reality, it might cost me ten angry letters to the local politician. Cost is in the eye of the beholder. And ten angry letters are probably worth more than a million dollars. And I want to do it for the minimum cost. So this is the classic reserve selection problem. Some sites... Like site A has a lot of species, some sites have few species, some species have a few sites, some species have lots of sites. Ecologists love making this sort of data, don't they? And they do ordinations. I don't know why. <laughs> What's the answer? CND. CND. Well done. So, what's meant to happen is you're not meant to be so smart. And then you have, to say, you have to say A, B, and then you think, oh, A's got the most species, uh, then what do I need? I haven't got my turn feeding area for the most I need B. It's energy A, B, and C. And I say, oh, you're wrong, it's C, and But the most important thing about that is, um, firstly, uh, even a small problem like that is not that easy. Now imagine 17,000 columns and 250 rows and everything isn't just a one or a zero, it's an amount, and every site has a different cost. A bit more complicated. More importantly, why is it C and E? This is a classic color I can see, it's an interdelinear programming problem. Um, the richest site is not in there. 
the most cost effective site is not there. If you take what we call a greedy algorithm, let's buy the site that gives me most per unit dollar, you will take out. And then you'll need the and you'll see you're not giving the right answer. In fact, this whole field of reserve selection was bogged down for 10 years because ecologists tried to invent algorithms to solve this problem, like the greedy algorithm, that find me the most cost effective site, then find me what gives me most per unit dollar, or buy me the site with the rarest bits. All those algorithms fail. Because integer linear programming problems are horribly big. How big is this problem? How big is this problem? How many reserve systems could I make? from eight sites. Let's just make random, how many different reserve systems are there with eight sites? Every site could be yes or no. So if every site's yes or no, there's two to the eight possible reserve systems. If there's 17,000, there's two to the 17,000 reserve systems. Can't be that big a number. Can I just look at every possible one and see which ones are there? So I'll get my computer going, I'll look at every single possible reserve system for the Great Barrier Reef, and I'll see which one the best one meets all my targets of preserving 20% of everything is compact and, and annoys as few people as possible by minimising the impact on fishing, commercial, and recreation. Why don't I just look through every possibility? Do you know how big that number is? Uh, it's about between 10 to the 5,000. That's one followed by 5,000 zeros. How many protons are in the universe? We're in the physics school, aren't we? How many protons are in the universe? Well, they tell me there's 10 to the 79. I don't know. None of you bothered to even count. And, and, and then there may be dark matter that's 10 times bigger than everything else. So it could be 10 to the 80, but nobody knows. I don't even know what dark matter is. It doesn't really matter. I can make the universe ten times bigger, uh, and the number of the, the, the number of possible solutions to this problem that I've just told you is so much bigger than the number of protons in the universe. It's a bit like every proton in the universe having a universe in it. So you can't. So then you have to talk to a computer scientist or a mathematician, and they've invented algorithms. Firstly, well, greedy is not good. Uh, the whole is not the same as the sum of the parts. Uh, we, we can quickly formulate a conservation problem that is, is superficially intractable. We could set every computer on the planet running for a thousand years and we would not be able to be great. So we have to use mathematics. Fortunately, particularly ever since the Second World War, mathematicians have been obsessed with these things. Carl was talking about scheduling the Portuguese airline. <laughs> Uh, schedules, you know, which, which crews go on which plane at which time. It's an interdelinear programming problem. My brother works for Shell. He runs interdelinear programming problems to work out which, which place they should buy, which oil to take to which refinery. So they've been running these algorithms forever and we can get good answers to this problem. What is the problem? What is the problem? Well, I've told you the problem in words. Um, but I have to turn into maths to use the algorithms to find a solution. And this is, I suppose, um, reflects some of my experiences trying to convince people interested in conservation that translating conservation problems into mathematical problems is a good thing to do. And this is not modelling. Okay, this sounds so it's not modelling. This is translation. So what I've done here is said, um, how can we take that original problem, which was uh, pick some sites that could be in or out, get me all of my targets, 20% of everything, annoy as few people as possible. So that's it. That tells me every one of these 17 things can be in or out, 0 or 1. 1 if it's in, 0 if it's out. Uh, that says, in mathematics language, meet all my targets. I've heard this big matrix that you just saw, RIJ, which was the matrix you just saw. And every time I pick a side, I get some more species. I've got to meet targets. Um, Annoy as few people as possible. That's mathematics for annoy as few people as possible. Okay? And could I please make it compact and connected? So if I understand how these sites are connected to each other, I can also put in a multiplier that gives me bonuses for keeping things organised and compact. Otherwise, I'll just have a scattering of sites all over the place. So what have I done? Every time I used to put that up, people would say, you're modelling. For those of you who are familiar with 
models in ecology, I suppose all of you are, biology, all models are wrong. And some of them are actually terrible, aren't they, really? What is a model? It's a prediction of the future in space and time. Oh, the future is always a prediction in space. And they're all wrong, and some are actually horrible, they're horribly wrong. So the reason I don't call this a model is because if I call it a model, everybody thinks it's terribly wrong. It's not a model, it's a translation. So get me a bit of everything by like choosing some sites, annoy as few people as possible, make a compact reserve system, I could translate that into French. I've got to speak French. Okay. Or I could, my wife who speaks, learns ancient Greek, could turn into ancient Greek. Mine do is any good. If I turn into maths, then I can use algorithms of thinking using forever. And the solution is using an algorithm. That algorithm uh, we put into a software package called Marksan. People think Mark's and the model, it's a software package that finds good solutions to this and does a whole heap of other things to help with good reserve system. Mark's and is not a model. It's an algorithm that finds good solutions to a problem. So when people talk about models, it's clear that they're not talking about algorithms or problems. Because that's so important. The problem, if there's a if, if that problem is wrong, it's because I didn't translate the hopes, dreams, and fears of Queensland appropriately. I didn't do the translation right. And I, maybe I didn't. Maybe they didn't want 20% of every head at that time. Maybe this cost surface that's an amalgam of recreational and commercial fishing costs is not right. So that's not a modeling problem, that's a translation problem. The algorithms, people often say, well, have you tested Marksand? Well, yes, we've tested it. Uh, it's 99.5% it's correct because it's been tested on thousands of problems by computer science all over the world. The error rate in the algorithm is tiny compared to the error rate of the data that goes in. And people want me to test it, I'll say, because they think it's an ecological model which should be tested, of course, because then really some of them are good, some of them are rubbish. So the semantics of this is absolutely crucial, crucial, absolutely crucial to get so did it work? Um, it did, it worked, it worked slowly. We started on this in 1998. Uh, we rewrote the software, developed the software. Ian Ball was a PhD student who developed this software. Intriguingly, the only reason he developed this software for Boris was because I couldn't get him a PhD scholarship, so he had to do something useful. And we got money from the government to do forestry work. Then we went to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. The software was called Spexan, short for spatial explicit annealing. They said that works for forests, it won't work in the sea and everything in the sea is completely different. I said, no, it's exactly the same. And so then they said, go away and fix it. So we went away and we re renamed it. And we called it Marks. It said Specs And the MAR was enough to make them think it was useful in the sea. <laughs> now, um, people in forests don't want to use it because they think it's for the sea. <laughs> the problem's exactly the same. That works for forests, it works for desert, it works for... Uh, that's what it does. In 2004, the Great Barrier Reef was rezoned. Now, 33% no take, and at least 20% of every single habitat site is conserved. And that's really, really important. Okay, really, really important. Why is it? This country, the United States, has a reserve system that may eat, needs that Aichi target of 17% conserving of the entire country. 17% net take. Tick. But the Aichi target says get 17%. It's a representative sample of your ecosystem. How are you going with the prairies? Uh, How are we going with the prairies? 1% conserved? How are you going with rocky mountains and glaciers and stuff? Yeah, pretty good, 50% something. So it's very easy for countries to meet that meet their AT target, 17%, and build a relatively rubbish reserve system. I'm not saying that those rocky mountains aren't wonderful, but it isn't a representative reserve system. This is the, this would, if this was in any, if this was a country, this would be the most representative, the most equitable reserve system of any country on that. So, great. It looks as though science works, uh, algorithms works, models work. Uh, why did we get it? There's a lot of politics behind that. We had a minister who was an environment minister from a right-wing government who was committed to this. His name was Robert Hill. He was our longest-standing environment minister. He drove it through cabinet. And the fact he drove it through cabinet, having left the environment ministry, and moved up to the defence minister. How often does an environment minister become a defence minister? <laughs> <laughs> Usually they're sort of down the bottom, aren't they? And they're sort of either retiring or they're being tested and then they get thrown out. Uh, so we were very, the, all the stars aligned. We had a, a long standing environment minister 
We convinced him to build Australia's marine protected area system. We went through to become defence minister. He was the head of the Senate, our upper house. He was the head of the Senate when this went through. In the cabinet meeting, the week before, when I was talking to the environment minister, him, they said this will go down to one vote. We may or may not get it. So everybody thinks this is this was one vote on one day, uh, late June 2004. The and there's a lot of issues. You can talk about science issues. What I really want to say is sometimes it's just an alignment of random stars. And ever since then, of course, lots of people have been using MarkSan, and sometimes it's worked. Sometimes we've actually we just delivered a big reserve system in Malaysia, which was eight years, the biggest marine reserve system in Malaysia, has lots of bells and whistles that the old MarkSan doesn't have, allows for zonings, allows for more productivity, but it took eight years. In other places, people use MarkSan, they develop plans, nothing like that. In other places they develop plans and what we get is not so good. So anything can happen. And to give you an example, you might think, oh, Australian is very, very perfect. That would be wrong. Um, because now I'm going to talk about how we then get to the next step to build Australia's protected area system across the entire exclusive economic zone. Uh, so Australia claims an area of sea the size of the land. I think we actually stole some of these Timor in Indonesia, but we don't talk about that in the northwest. Um, this is a vast area, 9 million square kilometres, the size of Western Europe. And that's the reserve system that we developed about, about eight years after the Great Barrier Reef was protected. So you can see, uh, again, green areas. Have a look at those green areas. Just also remember the scale of this issue, the scale of this area of sea. Is that a representative reserve system? They're pretty big, aren't they? They're big lumps. There's a whole heap of the coral sea in there. Um, do you think there's any biases to that reserve system? They use marks and we worked with the federal government for five years organising their data, training them how to run marks and getting the software going, getting the cost data, helping them. They worked with the industry and all these things happened. They thought, well, this is great. Let's focus in on one particular area. Here we have all the, all the science, all the algorithms, everybody agrees, no marine ecologists disagree, building a reserve system, we probably want to conserve about 10% of everything. And the reserves, this is the no take areas off the Kingway. Again, the scale of these areas are huge, this is a thousand kilometers by two, 200, 300 kilometers, a thousand by 300 kilometers. There's an enormous marine park there, and there's two or three other small marine parks. And that marine park, of the blue area does an incredible job of conserving the abyssal plain. The abyssal plain, there it is. Who's been to the abyssal plain? <laughs> it's 3,000 metres deep. And I'm sure there's going to be some deep sea marine ecologists who will be offended by what I have to say. It was, wasn't under a lot of threat, the abyssal plain. So we've done exactly what most countries do on the land. What most countries want to see, we have committed the ultimate sin of building a protected area system that meets our 10% targets. We run around, all the green groups say, yay, we've got a huge protected area system, and we protected something that wasn't under threat, at least in the foreseeable future. Many of these entire ecosystems don't even have a hectare of marine protection. Why? Because over that entire area, this is an old map, over that entire area, there are oil and gas leases. So, stupid view. I thought this was how we negotiate with the fishing industry to get a compromise on a reserve system that generally helps the fishing industry through, through stock recruitment and other activities. It's nothing to do with the fishing industry. It's just due to the fact that almost every country in the world is relatively determined to extract every cubic centimetre of fossil fuel it can from anywhere. Uh, fossil fuels are there, fisheries are there, maybe agriculture's here, conservation's here. So occasionally conservation gets somewhere with fisheries, <coughs> sometimes agriculture, not often with urban areas, and never gets anywhere with fossil fuels in mind. So uh, science <coughs> sometimes works, sometimes fails. And there's been many applications of Marxan around the world, and they would range from uh, disaster to wonderful. Uh, Gabon is wonderful. So the last thing I want to talk about before I have a bit of chat about TNC is, is 
sort of reflect sort of our interest in delivering solutions for conservation. So this is a solution about protected areas. We've also delivered a solution about allocation of plants for threatened species, a management of single species populations. And then we started getting very interested in monitoring issues of how, how much money and time should you spend on all of this. I'm going to tell a quick story about that. And this, this will upset at least one of you, I hope. This is Scotland, a big environmental statistics conference with lots of, well, actually, many of the world's best environmental statisticians, St Andrews, brilliant people. And they've just been given a million pounds to design a monitoring scheme to see whether the puppins breeding was being affected by climate change off the coast of Scotland. On these islands. And they had a bit of data. They had one island that had been visited, two or three islands that had been visited ten times, they had a few islands that had been visited once. And then they designed this uh, optimised uh, maximal power statistical design to reject, to see whether they could reject the null hypothesis that happens or not in decline. Beautiful statistics, beautiful science. Uh, and I gave the final plenary just before the dinner, and I said, why? Why did you do that? What are you going to do? So I can T and C the same thing. Papandrin, suddenly that after 10 years and a million pounds, we discovered that are in decline because of climate change. Should we buy them all a fridge? <laughs> uh, should we hand feed them sand eels? Um, should we say climate change is killing the right to China? Dear China, stop burning coal. Uh, dear Australia, stop selling China coal. Um, well, the polar bears, we've worked out on the polar bears and they've done a reasonable job, but I don't think adding puppets into the mix is going to do anything. So they were a little bit upset with me. So that night, when I was sitting, uh, having dinner alone, they bought them had enough, had enough whiskey to come up and say, if you were a bit upset with your talk, they had three or four talks on this stuff, and I said, we're a bit upset with your talk. Um, we've decided we do have an action, and the action is we need to tell Greenland that they're the one place which will probably keep companies. So I thought, okay, there is an action. If we're definitely going to Scotland, why not just tell them anyone? Dear Greenland. We think our puffins are in trouble, could you look after yours? <laughs> so sometimes, if there is nothing you can do when you discover the science, maybe you could think of some other science to do. If there's only one thing you can do, do it. Particularly if it costs almost nothing. So that led me to be obsessed with things like value of information theory. What is the return on investment from monitoring and knowledge? What's the point of doing science at all? Well, we had a job, but... Um, so these are sort of the checklists I want to talk through is, you know, if I do this monitoring, if I gather this information, if I learn new stuff, could it change what I do? Are there some actions that I could do? Could it discover a new action? Could I invent a new intervention that would help the golden wing warbler? You know, could that be what I need? Is it, is it going to allow me to choose between whether I should manage the forest in this way or that way? Um, uh, and is the expected benefit of uh, that change, is that outweighing time and expenditure that I spend doing all the science? That's even more challenging. So how do I put that into a diagram? In almost all of our work in conservation, we have a model. Now sometimes it's a complicated computer model, sometimes it's just a mental model. We have a model in our head, or on a computer, or on a piece of paper. We have a model. Uh, and we often have an intervention, right? Well, the Scottish shouldn't have any intervention. Let's say we have a strategy, and we know there's uncertainty about many of the things in our model. We always have uncertainty. So here's an uncertain parameter. It could be the, the death rates of golden wing warblers, or it could be uh, the probability they will use nest boxes, and I don't think they use nest boxes. It could be anything we're uncertain about. So we have that uncertainty. Whether or not the strategy works depends on this uncertainty. And so then most of us think, well, we better sort that out. If there's only one thing we can do, we don't need to sort it out, just do it. That's it. And if there's two things we could do, then one's always better, do B. How often? I mean, so in a sense, it's not a matter of finding the thing that we're most uncertain about, it's actually 
tiny things that when we resolve the uncertainty, if we could work out where this parameter really was, if we resolve that uncertainty, it would change what we do. So in this case, there could be 10 strategies. If one of the strategies is always better than everything else, we don't need to resolve the uncertainty. We don't need to do the monitoring and the science. More interestingly, whether or not we do A or B, might depend on resolving the uncertainty. But in this case, the benefit is a tiny difference between A and B. And if resolving that uncertainty is going to take us a million pounds and 10 years, maybe we should just stick with A. So this is the value of information case. And it's not me, it's people, who are, say, USGS and Tuxen and other people in this country who have tried to argue that we should put all our science through a value of information agenda if it's about a particular problem. But of course, this is the case that's most interesting. And the ones that, this is where we want to do our science, isn't it? When the thing we don't know, once resolved, could make an enormous difference to what we do, it will change whether or not we're going to save the species or save the ecosystem or do we own that now. But what do we do? We do power analysis. Or we do other forms of statistical analysis. We focus on the things that have the biggest uncertainty. It may not be the thing that has the biggest uncertainty, but it's the uncertainty that we have to resolve. And I don't see that often that. Sometimes it's done at the back of people's heads. So we've now taken all this thinking about decision science and optimization, which we apply to reserve selection, allocation of funds to projects, uh, fire management, single species management. So we start to think, how can we take that optimization view uh, into problems about the value of information, the value of monitoring and research? And we've sometimes found it's not worth doing the research if you're only interested in solving a problem. Now, there's many wrinkles to that. Research has many benefits other than solving a problem. For example, the research on the gold mean warbler might help three other species of warblers. So we shouldn't take that into account. So there's collateral benefits. Sometimes when you're doing research, you discover things you didn't expect serendipitously. So that might be useful. Sometimes research is important for communication and engagement. But if you're only interested in research and delivering a better outcome, you better make sure that you know the resolution of the uncertainty is going to make a big difference to your outcome. And we've looked at that across a whole series of problems, so probably at least a dozen of problems, and we've often found monitoring and research is not a good investment. So this is, of course, where in a university, this is not the talk you want to give. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not the talk you're going to because you're basically saying, if I'm going to the from TNC's perspective, or anybody's perspective who's trying to deliver the optimal outcome, maybe I should be investing my money in more action, not more research. So that I think the researchers need to prosecute their case very, very clearly. Hopefully that helps you guys prosecute your case, and I know a lot of you are doing applied research. So outline the action, show that resolving that uncertainty will either deliver a new, much better action, or will actually uh, allow you to choose an action uh, that is superior to what you're already doing. Yeah. And this value of information theory has got a lot of papers out there. There's a few I might range to this uh, friend and colleague that we got involved with this paper. I think that's some of the best stuff in this space in USGS, but we've done a few things. You know, one of my favourites one is Jennifer McGann and I. You know, those animal people, they love sticking things on animals, don't they? You know, there's any number of people with seals wearing rat collars and albatrosses with tags and they're being tagged and stuck and, and then we find out where they go and uh, I say here. So now I know the turtle's feet here are breathing. What was I going to do with that? And every time somebody does one of these studies, they say this will pay the conservation of the species. That's an easy thing to say at the bottom of your conservation letters and conservation biology paper, but I want more. I want to know how resolving that uncertainty is able, enabling me to choose action that I would not have otherwise chosen. Other, if not, I'm going to say, you're leaving it out for me to sort out what to do now. Just gathering data about where animals go, that's the only way to deliver uh, conservation outcomes. And of course, ultimately, almost all research is eventually useful, but I think we're in a bit of a mess with biodiversity. I need to think a bit faster. I want to know what's going to give us the biggest benefit to conservation action now, not something that will eventually be useful. Not that I'm arguing against pure science, I think pure science is also good. Okay. 
So the last thing I want to say in some senses, and I'll talk a bit briefly about CNC and I'll ask questions, is so that's how my brain works. I'm a very simple person. Every single member of my family is an engineer or a physicist. Except I married somebody because it's just plastics just for interest. <laughs> so this is this is this is decision science, this is why. Six steps. I'm trying to get TNC or Dr. Save Rico. This is how you solve a problem. You have to set your objective. That top one, what do you want? That can take three years with a community group in the Solomon Islands. That can take you, those of you who work, you know, in agricultural landscapes, that can take you five years. What can I you do? What are the things you can do? What can you change? Maybe you can't change anything. Then the third thing is, is what we, what I love doing, it's called modeling. How do I work out whether the levers I pull get me the outcomes I want? And then this one is optimization. I also love that. You know, how do I decide which of the levers to pull and how far? And then I'll do it, of course, this is the bit we also all talk about. It's called active adaptive management or adaptive management where we should evaluate, monitor and go around the loop. Usually by then we're exhausted. We just get to doing it. I, hope, I think TNC gets to doing a fair bit, otherwise we're all in trouble. Um, but we forget to learn. And that's the one thing I've learned about TNC is when I talk to all the senior scientists, they say unanimously, we are not evaluating the impact of our on ground actions in our and I'm sure many of the people in this room also feel the same thing. You know, it's all very well to have an experimental field plot or look at some barnacles on the rocky shore and put up cages, but landscape scale interventions, which TNC does all over the world, should be evaluated. They should be uh, evaluated in multiple ways their impact on biodiversity, water, people, equity, and then they should be reported back in the theory of literature, and then we should reevaluate everything our objectives, our actions, choose more actions, and go around the loop. And we've talked about that. How long have we been talking about adaptive management? or Walters or Hillmore or somebody at BBC or maybe there's people in the 1950s who, who were talking about this. But this is life, isn't it? This is how you drive your car or drive your bicycle to work. This is how you decide what to do with your day. You're always resource constrained, whether it's time or money, making decisions, getting outcomes, re-evaluating what you do in a number of ways and you start again and go around that loop. But in conservation, we have to say we're just not going to be a great job. So that's my broad mission is get them to buy into the full active adaptive management cycle, both on their little preserves here in New York, all the way towards changing national policies in a country like Zambia. We need to take an active and sometimes the learning is not going to have a good design. Sometimes it's going to be highly qualitative, not always quantitative. We've got to report and learn. And we've also got to talk about our favourites. It's also really done in the environmental NGO sector. We need to record the times and the investment, the money we spent, and then we need to say the sector didn't work. Why? Because otherwise we don't learn. If you ignored all the stupid things you did, where would you be? Mm -hmm. You'd probably be right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, not, having tried to do things for a long time, and people say, well, what works and what works, I sort of genuinely have to say I have no no idea how to get anything done. But I do know that if you don't turn up, you don't get anything done. So I have to say, turning up is what I've done a lot. And then to talk about the 17 committees, I've spent 50 full days a year giving my services to governments and environmental NGO movements while I was an academic. And now I'm giving more of my time to those things. So turn up, what else do I do? Four. Um, Play the ball, what does that mean? So it's a sporting analogy. Um, uh, we always sport, you, you attack the ball, not the person. And I can guarantee you that's the, if you have to deal with the media, if you have to deal with a contentious situation, never ever remark on the behavior of any individual, even if you dislike them enormously. Donald Trump included. Okay? You, you can attack what they've done, you cannot attack them as a person. It does not work. Does not work, and that's standing because I had raging arguments in the media for years with individuals who I can have a sit and have a drink with because they know I never attack them as a person. 
and do all those things to um, argue about the issues of people. Random stuff happens. Random stuff happens. Um, we try and communicate, I want to talk about that. I want to leave that up there as the last thing, so I just made that slide. No, um, Deborah and I are here, Deborah's our lead soil scientist. I'm chief scientist, we claim to have 600 scientists. We have done many things with people in this room uh, with the National Conservancy, many partnerships, many interesting projects. And I would have to say, I feel as though the whole is the same as the sum of the parts. So there's been lots of productive pro projects, but there is no meaningful relationship. This, we've been dating for a long, long time. We're not married, okay? We're not even committed to having a family together. We just, or, you know, we're just dating. We're still splitting the bill when we go to dinner. So what we need to do is to actually say, maybe there's a whole heap of things we could do together that actually says we're committed to this. We're not just going to do if a little project on invasive weeds on this property. Here's a project of water quality in this stream. Uh, we can actually go a little bit further and actually uh, think about uh, a more meaningful interaction. And of course, the Atkinson Centre and David and, and other people at the Atkinson Centre have been working on this. It's difficult. I don't know if you remembered when some of you probably are actively engaged in the process of forming a relationship with another individual. Is it smooth? Does it always go well? Do you never argue? So, take. <laughs> You know, your bottom line, and this is, you've got to be prepared to disagree. And things won't go well. Like, we won't send you the money we promised two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole heap of things that happen. Was that the now? That mission of you. <laughs> we haven't sent the money we promised two years ago. So, uh, but then I really would love everybody in the audience to think about what kind of, what form of relationship will this take? Will we? cohabit in a house, will we share the same bed, will we raise children, or should we just have a vegetable patch? I don't know what it is. What are we doing together? And there's lots of fun things we can do together. You know, you know, I think that US Fish and Wildlife Service co-op units is a good idea. Should TNC have something similar? If we're not co-located, can we really have a meaningful interaction if we're not living in the same house together? How much should we be trying to endow? How much can we go together to to different funders of Joint fundraise projects, philanthropists, how much of those things can we do and what form do they take? And should we be getting together more? One thing talking to me, I don't, and Deborah, we have two of 600 people. Had, and I know uh, the New York chapters here, there's many, many scientists we've been talking with. Have we had a, a more meaningful, integrated uh, discussion about what we can do together? So uh, I'd like to leave you with those thoughts and, and thank you very much for listening. Thanks.
sort the catchments out, pay these farmers to put in more green crops, uh, reforest, uh, take away these sewage treatment plants, uh, or put in sewage treatment plants, all these things. So we get them, we get a win for biodiversity because we get more uh, uh, forest cover, and we hope that we will deliver them clean water at a more regular rate uh, that's much cheaper than them doing these large infrastructure developments. That's happened a few times. Uh, we have a bit of evaluation. We don't know which, what will work where. Trees in urban cities. Some people say they're great, but they reduce stress, they reduce blood pressure, they increase mental health. Uh, there's some evidence for that, but relative to other interventions, I don't know. Maybe we could just paint all the buildings green. Uh, uh, and there's also evidence that trees in urban centres trap um, uh, uh, poor air quality. So if you have canopy cover over trees, then you're actually stopping uh, 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 some of the not just chemicals being produced in cities from escaping. So all those things need to be evaluated because we're talking in both of those cases about multi-million dollar investments. And, and uh, to be honest, I think uh, the environmental sector is good about telling the good news stories and also some of, some of the evidence is, is more argument and rhetoric than hard evidence. And even if you have a lot of models and a lot of small scale data, when you go to large scales, then do you really know it's going to work? We also at TNC are now very committed to not just delivering environmental outcomes, but delivering outcomes in terms of the people. And what does that mean? That's health. But it's also things like equity and, and equality in terms of uh, the women and things like that. Do we always monitor our interventions? We go into grazing lands in Tanzania and reorganise the grazing. We deliver some outcomes to wildlife and we increase profitability. Do we really double check that this hasn't somehow altered equity between villages within a village and for men and women? And I don't think we always do this. So we're sort of in increasingly committed to sort of triple bottom line evaluations. And, and I have to say, it's easy to say, it's very hard to do. Yeah, thanks. As a follow up to that question, one of the, one of the things that I thought I was hearing as a theme of, about <coughs> some of the problems that come up are essentially having the wrong objective function that you're trying to maximize over. So, Strategically, how do you think about how you as an organization go about getting that objective function right and getting the right values and the right people uh, to express those values into what you're trying to um, use the math that you showed? Sure. If I could have thought of a more, more difficult question to ask, I'll be okay. That, you ask that, that one. <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah, and you'll never get everything wrong because, because no, all, the objectives of all people in society are never going to match up. That's just the problem. With the Great Barrier Reef, we could we have different communities. We have the fishing community, the tourism community, we have recreational fishers, we have the bait, we have the restaurant owners, we have the hotel owners. But then we could say, well, they're all involved. But what about people who live in Brisbane? They're sort of involved because it's a Great Barrier Reef. What about you? Did you give a say on whether or not the Great Barrier Reef will... It's, it's a global asset. It's, most of you in this room will one day visit it. Well, if you don't visit it quickly, it might be there. So uh, uh, it, that's hard. Who, who, whose objective is it? And then that problem is constrained as a series of multiple sort of integrated objectives. And then one of the things that's in there is a constraint. We said we wanted 20% of everything conserved. Why 20%? The green groups keep saying to me, can you write a paper that proves that 20% is enough, but 19 isn't, that 21 is too much? I say, oh, that's a tricky thing. <laughs> uh, 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 what are we, at the moment, we've got this big debate about nature needs half and half Earth. I guess that they're two different groups of people. One says the planet needs half, and the other needs the planet needs half. And there's a huge movement by like protecting half the planet. And I've been asked to, I just say, all I can say is that more is better for nature. More protected areas are better for nature. There is no magical threshold. There's no magical threshold. And in work on population viability analysis all my life, there is no magical threshold. More is better. So I actually say it's 
not 20%, it's not 17%, it's not 10%, it's not 50%. I say we should do more conservation and when the biodiversity loss rate falls to background level, we can stop. Okay? So when extinction rates drop a thousandfold, then I will resign my job. Related to that point, I think, uh, is the thing that keeps going through my mind as I hear talk about optimization, which is that if they were optimizing things when they were modeling what to protect in upstate New York, we would never have the Adirondack. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the question is, uh, where does wilderness come in right. as, a, as a concept? Yes. And, may, and it's right. certainly related to this point. But, yeah. but you don't get wilderness by optimizing. You get well, it by... You do. It's just a different objective. <laughs> and maybe the heteronics is there because nobody wanted it. Mm -hmm. you know. So maybe it didn't have to. It's there because nobody wanted it. Like so, yeah, if you can factor in wilderness factors, you can put in any problem you like. So optimising is, is, is neutral. It, 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 we've got to discuss what we really want. So I think this issue about equitable protection is debatable. And it certainly should be debated. But for the time being, I think it's it's a good thing to progress to because I would like to see more of the rarer ecosystems in the marine terrestrial sector. I would like rarer ecosystems better protected. Uh, but I agree, you know, what is the role of large landscape? The TNC is grappling that without the moment, definitely. What is, what is their importance? Maybe, you know, conserving another thousand hectares of prairie in Iowa uh, is relatively useless. Too small, climate change got too dark. No use. So maybe we should just triage three region island. So, but you know, the trouble is most people don't want to have the discussion. So, I think yeah. the the good thing about decision science is it forces you to have that fight. Let's say negotiation. Yes. In, in the business.